I'm Britt Bingold, and you are listening to Season 3 of Learning Unlocked. Educators are the key holders to unlocking learning for students. Today, as always, my goal is to provide you with resources and tools, the keys, to enable and accelerate learning for all students. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. Welcome to episode 23 of Learning Unlocked. Today, my guest is Kareem Farah. Kareem earned a bachelor's in finance from Washington University in St. Louis and a master's in secondary education from John Hopkins University. After joining Teach for America in 2013, he spent six years teaching in schools that support students with a high diversity of academic and social emotional needs in both Hawaii and Washington, D.C. Kareem was awarded the 2018 Standing Ovation Award for Excellence in the Classroom Innovation for his blended, self-paced, and mastery approach to teaching and learning. Kareem's work has been featured in Edutopia and CBS News, among other local and national outlets. Kareem and his co-founder, Robert Barnett, worked together to develop an instructional model that would empower every student, regardless of background, ability, or attendance, to master key content and skills. And our conversation today is unpacking this instructional model. I'm really excited about this episode, you guys, and I hope you enjoy. Hi, Kareem. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Britt? I'm doing well. I am super excited to be on summer break, but I am recording this in my closet, so I'm away from my children um, and their noise, and also it's good acoustics. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. I love the commitment. (laughs) I was like, you know what? This is where I'm going to go. So my husband's got them kind of busy so we can get this interview because I am so excited and I feel super honored that you're on um, our podcast, our small little podcast. Uh, PD podcast today. Um, It's a privilege to be here and I'm super, super excited to share a little bit more about our work. Okay. So the first question I have for you is just to tell me more about your story. Like how did you even end up in the field of education in the first place? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think I had a little bit of an unorthodox journey um, into the classroom. I thought I was actually going to be in finance. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in finance, but also studied um, education as a minor um, and actually interned after my junior year of college in an investment bank and just really hated it, to be frank. Um, (laughs) Uninspired by the work and was ready to move on Um, and was simultaneously actually working with students where I went to school, which was Washington University in St. Louis. I was tutoring students um, in St. Louis City and just loved working with kids and was also really just shocked at how different most students academic experiences were from mine i had sort of the privilege of getting to go to some really great schools growing up um, and knew that students didn't actually have the same opportunity i was afforded Um, and my parents didn't even have the same opportunity i was afforded because they were both immigrants who came from egypt and lebanon so Um, I really became committed at that point to trying to figure out a way to be able to empower other kids to have a similar opportunity, um, particularly from an educational perspective as I did. So I decided to pivot my career and become an educator. I actually spent my first three years teaching in the state of Hawaii, um, where I taught um, high school math uh, in a really awesome community called Waianae in Oahu, and then went to D.C. public schools, where I spent um, a number of years teaching there until uh, I left to run the Modern Classrooms Project full time. That's awesome. That's a great story. I actually, when I, so I taught um, for 13 years high school English, and um, all of a sudden got a crazy autoimmune disease, and mm-hmm. probably from stress, <laughs> and I couldn't teach anymore. They, I, they my immune suppressors make me too sick to teach, and so um, I kind of went through this crazy journey where I ended up 
working in finance um, from home. And I was like, this is killing my soul, like slowly. Like I miss being in front of kids and I miss teaching. And so I luckily just happened to end up with professional growth and development back in my district. And I'm loving it because now I get to train teachers and I feel like I get to reach a lot of other kiddos. So that's kind of funny how we both saw the finance world and went, nope. Um, that's fascinating. <laughs> Uh-huh. We were all like, this is not, this is not filling me. This is not filling my cup. <laughs> Definitely. So, all right. So yes, you mentioned the Modern Classrooms Project and you're the co-founder of um, this project. And I got sucked into it when I was listening to you talk about screencasting during remote learning on Cult of Pedagogy with Jennifer Gonzalez. And I was like, holy cow, my screencasts have been way too long and I am doing them completely incorrectly. And then I went down the Modern Classroom Projects, I guess, rabbit hole. Um, and I just was like, this needs to be everywhere. This needs to be what our kids are doing because this is how our kids are learning now, not just in the pandemic, but I think also in the classroom. But for our listeners, they're like, what are you talking about? Modern Classrooms Project. So can you just quickly explain the project's mission, your vision, your values, um, because we're talking about empowering every student. Um, and then after that, if you could just follow it up, like, where did you see this need? Because clearly you saw a need and then kind of created this um, project. Yeah. And let me know if you want me to go deeper into detail on the actual model itself, but I'll, okay. I'm going to explain it more on the higher level uh, yeah. first, and then we can dig into the, the key components of the actual approach. I mean, essentially... What we do is we build classrooms, empower teachers to build classrooms that actually respond to students' needs. Uh, our belief as an organization is that the traditional model of teaching and learning, the one-size-fits-all approach, uh, just isn't actually one that's designed to adapt to kids, but instead it requires kids to adapt to the system. Mm -hmm. Now, naturally, that's deeply problematic, especially when you're serving students with a high diversity of learning levels, social-emotional needs, or experiencing trauma. Right, they're coming to classrooms with every ounce of effort that they can, and oftentimes are facing incredibly extenuating circumstances. So then to expect those students to figure out how to adapt to a learning environment they're not used to or isn't suitable to the challenges that they face is not productive and certainly widens what I like to think of as like the opportunity gap, right? Where students farthest from opportunity are only farther and farther away. I, I summarize it and kind of think about it with any student who's experiencing chronic absenteeism. Um, right. Especially a student who's experiencing chronic absenteeism for reasons out of their control. Mm -hmm. You know, they're already facing these unique challenges each and every day. Then they come to class when they can, and they're already working from behind. They miss the live delivery of information that everyone's relying on, and they just don't feel like they have an on-ramp to success. Right. So the reason we built this approach is we wanted to come up with a way uh, that teachers could effectively serve a high diversity of learning levels and social emotional needs and build classrooms that actually respond to their needs. Now, this was developed because I taught in a large, big city public school where the diversity of learning levels in my classroom was honestly shocking in that I was serving students that were, you know, three, four grade levels ahead in math and students who were five, six, seven grade levels behind. I also were serving students that were experiencing an incredible amount of chronic absenteeism. In my first period when the bell rang, uh, on a good day, 50% of students were actually in the classroom. So delivering sort of a live lecture at the beginning of class through a traditional format almost felt like comically ineffective. Yeah. <laughs> um, so ultimately, you know, I, like many educators, were going home every single day thinking something's wrong like fundamentally wrong with the way that I'm teaching my students. And every min additional minute I put into the planning process isn't actually translating to any real impact on the back end um, and felt committed to create a change. The last thing I'll add about the way that we do our work, um, separate from the actual instructional model, the, the, the program and the model that we scale, is that we believe deeply in bottom-up innovation. So our perspective was, look, if we're going to wait until the entire education system changes, or the district level changes, we're going to be waiting forever. And we've seen this historically in teaching and learning. So our goal was to think about how any educator in any classroom can innovate to create change. And we started with our own. We said, look, we can't demand that our principal or our school district makes radical changes when we ask for them. 
So mm-hmm. what can we do in the four walls of our own classroom yeah. to meet our students' needs effectively? And if we can figure that out without the system changing, then that's going to actually be an idea that is then able to scale on its own and can kind of go viral. So that was the goal there. Well, it definitely went viral for sure. And I think a lot of teachers feel like that. They're like, okay, what can I do in my four walls to reach more kids? Because I remember feeling like, hey, I'm a pretty decent teacher. Like I've been doing this for a while. My students seem receptive, but I did always feel like I was teaching to like the middle and not reaching necessarily like my kids that like could achieve more, but I just, I just didn't have the time to like help them propel forward. Um, just in my traditional model. And then I had the kids that were, yeah, chronic, chronically absent, um, just having a hard time catching up. And then their self-advocacy and concept in my class was really low. So even trying to get them to catch up, they would just put their head down. They're like, it's never going to happen. Um, and no matter what I did to encourage them, I was feeling like I was just kind of hitting a wall and it was like really, really frustrating. Um, so it seems like that's something you were experiencing as well. Absolutely. I mean, the irony of the teach to the middle model is there's not actually that many kids in the middle. Yeah. Um, right. So like that was the piece that was most shocking to me is like, it's one thing if you teach to the middle and that's 98% of your students. But I right. know when I taught to the middle, that was like three out of 30 kids. Um, yeah. The rest were either bored or feeling completely lost. Right. So, and I think that's what most teachers face. Very few teachers particularly who are in our public education system mm-hmm. are walking into the classrooms that are homogeneous in learning levels and social emotional needs. Like that's a very rare beast that I don't think I've ever seen in my life. I don't think I've ever seen it either, to be honest. And I go in a lot of classrooms and observe teachers and I'm, I can tell you it's, I'm like, wow, we need, we need some change. And I felt like, you know, with the pandemic, this propelled teachers that would normally not screencast, not use tech, not use those types of things. Um, They were forced to in this way, but they also grew a ton and are now more confident with it. And so I felt like this model was something not so out of reach now, like not so scary, you know, to do um, some recording. So let's get into the the model. Um, What's your approach um, that you have for the modern classroom projects um, when you talk about classroom instruction? What's that model you're, you're kind of want to dig deeper into? Yeah, I mean, you know, in simple terms, it's blended self-paced mastery based, but those three terms now mean nothing as far as I'm concerned when you just say them. So, you know, <laughs> our model has a very specific methodology for which we help educators blend their instruction create a self-paced structure, and then grade students on mastery. And each piece connects to the next with the final ultimate goal of that idea that students are actually graded on mastery. They move from one lesson to the next, not because of day of the week, but because they've actually achieved an understanding of the skills. So if we start at part one, which is blended instruction. Our goal there is to eliminate live lectures. Mm-hmm. Our belief was that live lectures were inequitable. Uh, because they just put anyone who couldn't make it to the live lecture or who weren't emotionally ready to listen to that information at a disadvantage. They're also a really poor use of teacher and student time. So we kind of saw the lecture as this bottleneck to innovation and effective instruction. So that was the first thing we sought to eliminate. We eliminate live lectures through what you've mentioned, screencasts, right? This idea that a teacher can build their own instructional video. The reason why we want teachers to build their own instructional videos is because they're creative, they're personal, they're aligned to whatever resources that they need to use in their particular district or school environment. And ultimately, teachers are the most important factor in student learning. And they're going to know what is best for their particular school and community. So that's phase one. You get rid of those live lectures that truly is the bottleneck to innovation. Mm -hmm. um, And you create those screencasts. And now you've blended instruction. The second phase there is once you've eliminated live lectures, you actually realize that that was the reason you didn't let kids work at different paces. Right, we've restricted the capacity to infuse elements of self-paced instruction because every kid has to be sitting at the beginning of class listening to you deliver some sort of information. So once you've eliminated that, eliminated that, you can actually let kids work at their own pace. But what's specific about our approach is that we don't actually believe in sort of endless self-pacing. Uh, we believe in self-pacing with guardrails. If you just let kids self-pace for nine months at a time, right? Really high-performing students are going to take off. And your students who really need more support are going to get demoralized and lose confidence. So in our classrooms, kids are self-paced in chunks, usually at one unit or a time or a half mm-hmm. unit at a time. 
Um, and that allows, you know, literally kids to be at different spots in the unit and they progress. So ultimately when you've achieved a self-paced environment, now that unleashes the capacity to grade students on mastery mm. or through competency. Um, and that just is essentially the concept that a kid does not travel from lesson two to lesson three because it's Wednesday and not Tuesday. They mm -hmm. travel from lesson two to lesson three because they actually understood lesson two and demonstrated that understanding on some sort of mastery check or a little mini assessment. Okay. So I love this. I'm going to dive in really quick backwards to the self-paced portion mm -hmm. um, approach a little bit. Um, I think our teachers can do the instructional videos and they can do them well. I really do love what you say about making sure that they're not super long, that you give them opportunities to pause or you use um, things like Edpuzzle to um, have them answer questions as they're going through. Um, and I love that because in our district, we really talk about chunking direct instruction into short bursts and then doing an active learning experience or something afterwards to get the kids doing something. So let's say they have their instructional videos made. And does that take a little bit of time on the front end? Is it like a lot of front loading when you're first starting out? Uh, absolutely. I mean, okay. I, I kind of describe this process as more planning intensive, but much more relaxing and pleasant classroom experience. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, like I describe a traditional classroom as one where both parties are tense. The teacher is tense, trying to put on a performance and get everyone in order. And then on the flip side, kids are tense because they're like, this is restrictive. I don't really love this. And tension meets tension is not a great recipe for success. Right. So in this model, there's a planning intensive element. But once you've achieved that, the classroom environment's much more relaxing. It's all about small group and individualized instruction. And you're actually in the headspace to be able to support kids, particularly our kids that are really experiencing distress. Okay. And I, yeah. So as they're doing their self-paced portion, um, they do these checks. So this could be like a Google form check or like an exit ticket to you, um, that type of thing where they're having, um, demonstrating their mastery. Do you have them go into like, partner pairs or collaboration um, during the self-paced time? Totally. So, I mean, the only things that we strongly encourage to be independent, unless the actual standard or skill you're assessing is collaborative by design, is right. the mastery check phase of a lesson, which, okay. you know, if a lesson on average takes a kid 80 minutes to travel through, we're talking about the last five minutes of that experience. Mm -hmm. being an independent experience. So okay. the Modern Classrooms Project, we kind of see collaboration happening in two forms. Um, the most common and frequent is what I call organic collaboration. So I'm a student, I'm on lesson three, I'm working on the assignment. I might be working with a friend of mine or another student because they are also on lesson three. Okay. Or I might be seeking out a peer who's already mastered lesson three and is now on lesson four and five because I can lean on that kid to support me. And that's organic collaboration. It's the type of collaboration we see in the workplace. Right. The type of collaboration we see in anywhere, frankly, is that we lean on our peers when we need help. And particularly, we seek out peers that we know have greater levels of experience than we do. And yeah. I always tell folks, in a traditional format, I always got exhausted by saying, hey, Jessica, go work with Tommy. Yeah. The two students being like, why? No, I don't feel like it. Um, you know, you can't yeah. really provide that answer in a, in a modern classroom. Mm -hmm. Because if I tell Jessica to go work with Tommy, that's because Tommy mastered the lesson Jessica needs help with. And gotcha. we have actual evidence of that. Right. It's, it totally kind of gives data driven rationale behind why students should be collaborating. Okay. I love that. So there are places for them in this process to work together, to collaborate. Um, and kind of make it a little bit more of a flexible classroom. Um, but I, what I love the most is now as the teacher, I'm kind of like free, right? Cause I can like go talk to kids who need help, maybe pull some small groups in during this time because I've essentially cloned myself, right? That's right. Um, I mean, the primary goal of the modern classrooms project is to ensure that the vast majority when I say vast, I mean like 99% of teacher time is spent working in small groups and individually. Well, and that's exactly what I felt like I was missing was here I am delivering information and then I'm like, okay, now go work. And I would, it's not like I would go sit down at my desk, but I wasn't feeling like even though I was facilitating or trying to get them to do something, I wasn't necessarily having a whole lot of 
one-on-one time or small group time with those kids that really did need me um, on either side of the spectrum. Like I wanted to be able to extend some learning for some kids um, and then also kind of like grab those kids that were behind and make sure that they felt good about where they were at. And um, I know in your, in your approach, there's a must do, a should do and an aim to do or an aspire to do. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. And so um, the must do and the should do's, um, you are, is it kind of like, is the should do the more flexible one where it's like if a kid isn't necessarily like they've done like a couple, but they just can't get over like a certain hump. Is that like teacher discretion where you can say, hey, um, I know you've been working really hard. Why don't we just move on to X, Y, Z so that way we can, we can progress? Like, how do, you, how do you address that so that they don't get behind in that self-paced little mini unit that everybody's doing? Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, the, the lesson classifications are to do just that. Okay. So must do, should do, and aspire to do approach is taking the understanding that, look, if I give three weeks to tackle 10 lessons to all my students, some kids inevitably aren't going to be able to master all 10. If every right. kid could master all 10, then every kid was learning at the same pace and was inevitably at the same level. Okay. So the must do lessons are the lessons that the teacher has identified as non-negotiable. You have to master these lessons to be able to get on to the next unit. Okay. That might be five out of 10 lessons. That might be six out of 10 lessons. That might be four out of 10 lessons. The okay. should do lessons would be your traditional on grade level standards. So, you know, if I opened up a textbook or I looked at the state standards, these are the lessons that technically every kid should master. So the bulk of the kids should master all the should do's. A portion of the kids will only master the must do's. And okay. then that last tier is extension lessons, essentially. So if you have kids who are, you know, just crushing these lessons and really excelling in the content, those are those lessons that extend their understanding even further. They're beyond the scope of what a normal set of standards for that particular unit are. They might be activities, they might be projects, but they really push kids further and sometimes can be viewed as sort of an extra credit style approach. Um, yeah, and, and that's only for a certain portion of students and those students are, are able to master the must do's and the should do's in the time frame given and have extra time. Okay, awesome. So. I, in my brain, when I was thinking of this, of like, as a teacher, I was like, okay, I totally have the must do's down. Like if I'm thinking about one of my units that I would teach before I became an instructional specialist, I was like, I know what's in that unit. I've done it so many times. I know what the must do's are. I could come up with the should do's. And then my brain got stuck on the aspire to do's because I don't want them to see it as like busy work or like extra work. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, what do I have them do that will extend that skill or standard still? But like, so you're, so you're saying it could even be things like, um, maybe they're going to do some, like, like a project that's kind of like ongoing, like maybe a genius hour situation where maybe they go and work on that more. Or I just, I was struggling so hot much. And I think a lot of my colleagues, when I was talking about this with them, like, what do those kids do? Because I don't want it to be like like an early finisher type situation. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to think about the extension lessons and those should do's and aspire to do's. Okay. And it all kind of depends on the grade level and the content area you're in. In particular, right. like my favorite aspire to do lessons are projects that kids continue to contribute to oh, throughout cool. the year. So, okay. I mean, if I have a kid who's really getting interested in some sort of concept related to, you know, designing something in architecture that requires an understanding of geometric shapes. Or I have a student who mm -hmm. loves to write and wants to potentially get something published in the local newspaper, then maybe the aspire to do is that whenever they're finished early, they get to contribute to that larger body of work that they want to be working on. Okay. I kind of um, love that because that's a lot of choice in, for them too. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. I had some students in my class when I taught high school who were really, really invested in the ACT or the SAT. Oh, So yeah. I had isolated in Khan Academy, the different English standards and the math standards in my case that were connected in particular to the unit they were just learning. Mm. So if they okay. got done with everything, they got to work on Khan Academy lessons that we're tackling these SAT skills and we would actually go over some SAT prep ideas and all that good stuff. Um, That's awesome. You know, so I, I mean, ultimately there's a variety of ways you can do this. In addition to that, most of the units I did and a lot of the units that educators will do are, are pro project-based learning. 
right. uh, which means that the final thing that everyone's doing in that unit is the project. So you can always think about extensions to the project Love that are that. challenging yeah. and can be pushed to the next level. You know, my, one of my favorite projects that I did in my probability and statistics class that my co-founder actually designed was a project where kids would look at different crime statistics um, mm. and actually try to provide policy recommendations for the mayor around what should change in the city to reduce violent crimes. Okay. Um, you know, in, in the project, a standard kind of expectation was you would assess five different indicators of crime, but an extension might say, hey, broaden your horizons, why don't you look at 10? Or why don't mm -hmm. you not just look at violent crimes, what about property crimes? Okay. Um, so, you know, those types of things can take a really long time. Oh, yeah. Um, but produce a really cool end product. Um, so those are the extensions I, I often really love. Yeah, or even putting maybe a makerspace or something in the corner where they can then go do some visual representations of their learning. Absolutely. Um, something maybe like that as well. I mean, one of my favorite implementers of the model, he's one of the first, his name is Steven Schultz, he's in DC. He actually has a teacher tips video on our teacher resources page on this. Oh, perfect, um, I'll link that. But he, uh, he uses a program called Classcraft, which is a gamification program. Uh huh, I've heard of it, yep. And he has, his whole classroom is set up in stations. And the reason why he uses Classcraft is because unlike most learning management systems like a Google Classroom or a Canvas, um, and I'm not sure which, which uh, learning management system do teachers use it. We've got Google Classroom, yeah. So, you know, most learning management systems for good reason are pretty linear, right? Like mm -hmm. one thing comes after the other. The cool thing about Classcraft is your lessons are kind of like little worlds. Oh, so they can sprout off each other. So he actually infuses an incredible amount of choice. So like you might start in the middle and it doesn't actually matter whether you go, you know, forward, east, west, south, you know, all that kind of stuff. You yeah. just need to tackle the five things that bridge off the world that you're on at the moment. And some of them are makerspace and some of them are, you know, writing up a report and some of them are playing with a different tool. Um, so that's how he designs it, particularly kind of to speak to exactly what you just described. Okay, awesome. I'm going to definitely link that for sure. Um, because yeah, that was my only thing. I was going through the, the, the course and I'm listening to your podcast, which is awesome. Um, and I was like, okay, what would I do? What would I do? Like that was just in my head all the time. I'm like, what, was my, what would be my aspire to do? So thank you so much for like just digging into that a little bit more with me. I appreciate it. Um, okay. So, and then I've, the course, I think the other thing that's going to throw teachers for a loop is this mastery based grading. Um, a lot of um, schools require like two grades a week. Like, and I feel like that's just because they want to make sure that teachers are updating their grade books regularly. And, but I think what happens is, and this is what happened to me, is that I really didn't have two grades a week to give because we were like learning something that week. Like it wasn't like there was no like performance task or like random, like, you know, it just, I felt like I had to always put in like some type of weird, like participation grade. And I just felt like it was fluff that didn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. And so do you, you, you kind of get what I'm saying. Totally. So I just, uh, I was like, Oh, I love this mastery based grading. Do they, um, when they do their checks, when they put them in the grade book, is it like, how do they label them or is it there a certain way that you would recommend them being able to maybe put these checks in and and say like okay this is for this skill this is for this skill would that help you think teachers and students really see their learning progression a little bit clearer yeah i mean there's a there's an, an endless number of ways to do this and i okay. talk about it briefly in the three-part piece that i did with cult of pedagogy the third one digs pretty deep into the mastery based grading side what i can yeah, that's a that's probably that's the most in depth piece I've ever written about mastery based grading. Um, but what essentially the first thing I'll say is folks have overcomplicated the concept of mastery based grading or competency based grading. <laughs> okay, like, it's probably it, me. It, I, it's everyone actually. <laughs> and I remember I joined a Facebook group years ago on mastery based grading, and I left it in like fifteen minutes because. <laughs> <laughs> People become so lost in like standard deconstruction, what constitutes mastery, yes. all that kind of stuff. Uh. And that is not actually the point. The point is just in your classroom, are you evaluating whether a kid has understood or not understood a skill? Or are you just giving them some sort of partial credit grade based on the number of questions they did or did not do? Right. And that's the key distinguishing factor. In other words, 
are you deciding whether or not a kid is ready for the next skill because they've understood the previous one? Or are you just telling them they should go to it because they did some sort of activity and completed the task? So the best way I can describe it is if, if you looked at my grade book when I used to teach traditionally, you might see a unit with five lessons. Okay. And each lesson might have had an assignment and an exit ticket. And you would have seen these crazy grades for kids. So one assignment, they have a 7 out of 10. And in the exit ticket, they have a 3 out of 5. And then the next one, they have a 2 out of 10 and a 4 out of 5. And the next one, they have a 10 out of 10 and a 5 out of 5. And then it spits out like an average, obviously. Right. From grade that means nothing to anyone. <laughs> um, right. Like you look at it and it says a C and you're like, I guess that's average. And then the kid's like, yeah, I guess I got a C. If you looked at my grade book, once I started implementing the Modern Classrooms Project, the actual categories didn't change. I had assignment, mastery check, assignment, mastery check, okay. assignment, mastery check. What was different is there were no partial credit grades. Nice. So if okay. a kid had grades for lessons one, two, three, and four, they were either a 90% or 100%, okay. every single one of those. And if they didn't tackle a lesson that they should have tackled, it was a zero. Mm. So if a student had mastered four out of five lessons in my classroom, they would have gotten an 80%. Okay. Because they got full credit for everything they mastered, and they got no credit for the things that they did not master. So it really changes your perspective on skill mastery from being this sort of like, yeah, I guess I'll give them some credit because they tried some things, to <laughs> this kid either understood the skill, and if they did, they have 100%, or they did not, and they have no credit for it. Okay. Um, and in my opinion, it actually makes the gradebook much easier to manage. It also makes the gradebook much easier to deliver to parents. When yeah. a student asks, why does my kid have a D in the class? Well, he's mastered mm -hmm. six out of 10 skills. There's okay. four other ones they can still master. Here are the videos, here are the assignments, here are the mastery checks, have them get going. Um, and then finally, from like a upkeeping your grade book, I mean, ultimately, this depends on school community and, and district and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. I have never in a modern classroom, nor have I ever heard a modern classroom educator say that they had trouble meeting the grade requirements, meaning- okay. You actually are doing a little bit more grading, but it's purposeful grading, and it's very right. fast in a modern classroom. Okay. Yeah, because you're only you're chunking skills at a time instead of trying to grade a huge band of skills all in one assignment, right? Exactly. Okay. All right. That makes so much more sense to me. Um, so they also have – okay, so we've got instructional videos. I feel like we got a little bit better at that during the pandemic. and. I think a lot of teachers are like, okay, I feel comfortable with that. The self-paced grading or the self-pacing, I think they're going to a little bit struggle um, because it's going to be new. And the mastery-based grading, I think, is going to be fantastic. I think it's going to be like eye-opening um, for kids, parents, and teachers. Um, but then there's this thing that just is elusive to me, <laughs> and it's the progress tracker. Um, I can you just for our listeners, describe what the progress tracker is and some of the different ways that teachers and students kind of use them in their classroom. I know you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the gamification of where they could go different places. And as a teacher, how do you keep track of where everybody is at, at the, what time? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, essentially, in simple terms, every kid needs to walk into their classroom in a modern classroom and know exactly where they are in the scope of the unit. Okay. When I say know where they are, I mean they need to know what lesson they're working on. They also need to know whether they're ahead, behind, or on pace. Okay. And the same applies for you as the educator. You need to have a firm understanding of exactly where each kid is at. Right. The method to do that is using a progress tracker. Now, these progress trackers can come in two forms. A progress tracker can be a personal tracker, meaning every kid has a game board or some sort of checklist in front of them for the unit that okay. they're constantly keeping tabs of, or it can be a public tracker, which is even more popular, which means it could be a PowerPoint slide with every kid's name on it and what lesson they're on and where mm. they should be at. It could be uh, kids' faces where they are Velcro or on like some sort of like popsicle stick or something like that that moves across some sort of game board. It could be okay. magnets on the whiteboard. Oh, I so like that. Yeah. As students start, um, they're all in lesson one. Then every time a student masters a skill, they move up on the progress tracker. If it's a PowerPoint slide displayed, I would change their name from being on lesson one to lesson two. Okay. If it's a game board that they have in front of them, I might sign the square that said lesson one. 
So they've mastered lesson one. They're now on lesson two. If their name is on a football helmet on a piece of Velcro, they're going to move their face up or their name to the next lesson. So all it's doing is creating a formal structure around progress. It okay. also encourages the collaboration piece because right. if I'm on lesson two and I'm stuck and I need help, well, I'm going to go look at the whiteboard and see who's on lesson three. I might go see other students' game boards and say, hey, I noticed you mastered lesson two. Can you help me? Um, mm -hmm. So that's the key uh, with the progress trackers. They're super, super useful. They're frankly critical. All yeah. the research on self-pacing says there has to be a consistent methodology for tracking progress if you actually want it to be a controlled chaos environment and not just complete chaos. Yeah, and I love controlled chaos because I was all about that as a teacher. And I just, I was just thinking to myself, okay, I used to track their progress, but I was like, it was just like kind of me and a clipboard. Mm -hmm. And I, the kids had absolutely no idea where they stood. So what I really like about this is that the kids know where they are, but then also other kids can also, if they make it public, um, can go seek out help and um, get help from other kids. So that helps. Um, and so there's different examples of this on uh, your website, right, of how teachers could move through the different progress trackers and figure out which one works for them and their kids. Say again? Do you have like um, examples of the progress trackers on the website? Oh, like absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, on the free course, you know, learn.modernclassrooms.org, yeah. I mean, there is like an endless number of them and you can okay. click and make a copy. <laughs> oh, um, awesome. And these come in different forms, right? Some folks are a little panicked or freaked out um, about having a public tracker. So they'll go with the personal ones like the game boards. Um, others love the public tracker. I certainly did myself. Um, and there's a ton of different ways to do it. I mean, I still learn about different progress trackers in modern classrooms every single day. Okay. Um, I'll go walk into a new classroom and see a new one. Um, and I'll think it's awesome. I saw one the other day that was super cool. That was like colored construction paper um, with kids' faces drawn out in a different way. And the kids would come running to the construction paper and move their name. So um, there's really a ton of creative ways to do it, but we have a ton of options as well just to create structure for folks. Yeah, I mean, you can even have a game board that's just protect projected to your whiteboard, right? And then they could just move the little magnets on the game board. That's right. Right? Something just simple as that? Of course. Okay. All right. That's awesome. That That's perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for just kind of giving us this quick brief overview of the modern classrooms project because i really do believe that this is like going to be critical moving forward um and it really is going to break apart um that traditional kids in rows sit and listen um the sage on the stage approach where they you know they just get delivered this information and they're expected to just absorb it somehow <laughs> and then regurgitate it um, on some type of exam later on. Um, and I love that you talked about a lot of progress or uh, project-based and query assignments and maker spaces because like those are all the things I think that are really high on um, in John Hattie's research as well um, that we've been kind of really focusing on as a district is this idea of like classroom cohesion and blended learning and all of those things that just seem kind of unattainable um, that I think this makes those things a little bit more in reach for our teachers. Of course. Okay, I have some rapid fire questions for you. If you don't mind me asking them, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, so you're gonna fill in the blank. Education is? Education is the most powerful way to empower kids to achieve their full potential. Oh, I love that. Yep, okay, awesome. All right, the number two, what or who inspires you? What or who inspires me? Um, teachers. Mm. I, uh, I try to schedule a call with a teacher I've never met every single week. That's um, awesome. Because teachers are the most creative people that I've ever been around, and they're most, the most committed people to creating true impact every single day. So teachers inspire me. All right. Yep. Me too. I love talking to teachers because they are so creative. <laughs> <laughs> like they just make it work um, no matter what. So they are inspiring. Okay, number three is if you could pass on any wisdom to students. I know you're running the Modern Classroom Project now, but you taught students for a really long time. Um, what would you share? I would share that the most important thing you can learn as a student is how to learn. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it can be frustrating as a student to learn skills that don't matter to you or feel sort of disconnected from the world around you or your passions. But what's most important is actually the capacity to learn a novel skill um, without an incredible amount of support. And I think the biggest mistake that we've made in our education system and in turn we've conditioned students to think is a lot of handholding and instant gratification. And yep. kids oftentimes get really frustrated when their teachers won't just spell out a concept for them. So mm -hmm. my biggest ad advice to students at any grade level or content area is push yourself to be a self-directed, self-aware learner. Because yeah. one day you are going to walk into a world where you don't actually have all that many supports around you, and your task is going to be able to is going to be to navigate that and teach yourself new things, um, and that's the most important skill you can learn in, in K twelve education in general. I I agree, and I think for teachers it's those probing questions, right? That don't that you don't feed them the answer right away or handhold them, but just keep learning how to do those like boomerang back questions to the kids oh. um yeah for sure okay number four what are your must-have smartphone apps like you cannot live without these on your phone cool um <laughs> we're gonna go with every single uh food delivery slash pickup app so we're talking <laughs> doordash uber eats caviar Back. okay as soon as this recording is done, because it's 7 p.m. almost on the East Coast. I, I know. I am that open, you know. and I yeah. will be getting something to eat. Okay. Um, Google Maps, obviously. Uh, at this point, I'm not even sure I understand how a map works. I just type it in. And uh -huh. keep it moving. Yep. Um, and the ESPN app. I'm a huge sports fan, particularly basketball, so I'm on there all day long. All right. See, that's, I needed to know. that's what I needed to know. I'm a DoorDash girl for sure. So. I love DoorDash, too. Oh okay. yeah, they're they're awesome. I love, and I have a lot of former students that work there. So then, part of me is like, I open the door and I'm like, "Oh hi!" That's awesome. <laughs> so it's kind of kind of fun, yeah. Um, okay, last one. What song do you know all the lyrics to by heart? What song do I know all the lyrics to by heart? I know it's my favorite song. I actually have a poster about it. It's called "Love Yours" by J Cole. Okay. Um, and I know every single word, and it's essentially um, a song about how the only life you should love is yours. Um, and I think it's an inspiring one. Um, it keeps me inspired every day, um, and it reminds me to just remember just how privileged I am to be able to do the things that I get to do every single day um, and to make the best out of the experiences that I've had. So that's the one. All right. Well, I don't know that one, so I think I'm going to have to like Spotify that and add it to my playlist. You should. It's a fabulous song. Okay. I'm totally going to do that. All right, so I'm going to highly recommend to my listeners um, and teachers to take your free online course. Um, I learned so much from it. Um, obviously, I had so many things I wanted to ask you that I reached out. I was like, I don't know. I'm just going to ask because, you know, I never know. Maybe he'll come on. And, and you did. And I so appreciate that um, because it just makes so much sense to me for what our students need now. So, um, if listeners want to learn more and they want to take that course and they're just curious about Modern Classroom Project, where can they find you online or on social media? Um, and how can that, that site really support them? Absolutely. I mean, our website is www.modernclassrooms.org. Okay. Um, the free course is at learn.modernclassrooms.org. Mm -hmm. um, you just make an account and you're good to go um, and you start learning. It's totally yeah, it's free. super easy. It's awesome. Yeah, and our social media accounts um, for Modern Classrooms are at Modern Class Proj. Um, so the word modern, the word class, and then P-R-O-J. Um, okay. And that's on Instagram. That's on Twitter. We also have a Facebook page and then a Facebook group. The Facebook group has about 5,500 educators in it right now. So Holy that's moly. a really interesting group. Um, we also have a podcast. So if you go to our website and you click on the teacher resources page, You'll see exemplar units, which are also in the free course, our podcasts, our webinars, and all that good stuff. Um, my per I, The only social media I actually use all that often is Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter, at KareemFarah23 is where I am on Twitter. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I think that covers it. Um, those are the, those are the. I mean, that's where you should start. You'll, you'll know, as you said, um, once you go down the rabbit hole, there's an endless number of resources we have at the organization. So there is. <laughs> they will not stop, um, but uh, that's where you should start. But I also love that once we get to the rabbit hole, we can get support from, you've got mentor teachers, right? Like some expert teachers that they can sign up for we to do. get some support. 
Um, and then you've got that awesome Facebook group that like, I'm super addicted to because <laughs> they are so nice. Yes. Like so nice. Everybody on there, if I ask a question immediately, is just like, boom, here's what I do. Here's what I do. Here's what I do. And then it's like, they share all their resources and like, give me copies of things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the nicest group of teachers ever. I agree. And I mean, it's just moderated by a couple of our mentors, but yeah. ultimately it's a community of people who are behind the movement around our model and are helping each other. So it's one of my favorite places to pop into. Yeah. It's, you know, it's nice to be around educators who kind of think and speak the same language as you, um, even though you're in completely different parts of the country or the world even. So Absolutely. That's been really cool um, to join. I, I would definitely highly recommend that. And I'm going to go ahead and link all that stuff in the show notes. So, all right, Kareem, thank you so much for talking to me. I hope that um, I can talk with you again soon. Um, but I really hope that you enjoy your dinner from whichever app you chose to use tonight. I, uh, I certainly will. And thank you so much for bringing me on, Brett, and to all the teachers listening. Good luck. You all have the most important and most challenging job in the world. And, and hopefully mm -hmm. our resources provide a blueprint for how you can use the things that you've learned over the course of the last 13 months or so um, to really create classrooms that are responsive to kids' needs moving forward. So good luck, everyone. Yeah. And, you know, I think your model also makes teachers a little bit happier because they get to spend time with more students. And I think that'll help sustain the profession. So thank you for creating this model. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a good night. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Learning Unlocked and finding out more about the Modern Classrooms Project. Obviously, I'm super excited about it. If you have listened today as a GPS educator, you can receive PD recertification credit by visiting our employee hub page and then navigating to professional growth and then digital PD courses. And then just a reminder that we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GPS Prof Growth. That's at G-P-S-P-R-O-F-G-R-O-W-T-H. For more information or the resources from this episode that we talked about being linked, please visit our website at learningunlocked.lipson.com forward slash website. We are distributed by Lipson and we are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Audible. Episodes are also available on our YouTube channel under playlists. Our intro and outro music are licensed from Melody Loops. Thanks again, key holders. Keep unlocking that curiosity, creativity, innovation within yourself, but also within your students. Stay kind and courageous, and I will see you next time.